I had training in science and broken science that preceded my interest in the subject by 45 or 50 years. And some of my earliest memories involve watching the black and white TV with the rabbit ears, no remote control, and then the toothpaste commercial would come on. And it'd say, nine out of 10 dentists recommend this toothpaste. And my old man, without fail, would jump up, bound across the room, turn it down, and explain that there's no voting in science, <laughs> that the dentist he wants to hear from is the one, that innovation comes out of the dissenter, not the, not the chorus. And these, these freaking commercials ran for a decade. I just, I know I'd see the commercial, the sense of that. Here goes my dad, I'm going to turn it down. I can see it. That's <laughs> just like a five year old, right? And yeah, yeah, there's no voting in science. And, and you know, roll the clock forward. So this is, they say, like 62 or 3, maybe, 60, 1961. I know, and I know it was June of 1967. Where at a, and I'm in, a, I'm in a sixth grade at an open house. You know what that is? It's where your parents go to school. You dread that shit, right? <laughs> so we go to school that night. And Milo Johnson is my sixth grade teacher, and he tells my dad. He says, "I have a sneaky suspicion that Greg has done nothing for his science project. It's due in two weeks." <laughs> he was exactly right. I, had <laughs> I figured I'd, I'd figure something out. I put some. Leaves in a jar, get some bugs or something, <laughs> and then put WD-40. <laughs> so uh, I was—I I thought I was in for it. Anything is possible after that, that news was broken. On the way home, my dad didn't say anything. That, that was making it even worse. In the morning, he didn't say anything. And I was like, I don't think he forgot. <laughs> he came home from work that night, and he had a little wooden case and a bag. And he's come sit down. And he sat me down at the table. And in the wooden case was a micrometer, vernier scale micrometer. It's a little device you, you turn, machinists use it, and you can get a read on the length of something to a ten thousandth of an inch. <coughs> and he had a bag of a thousand nails. And so he took one of the nails out, turned it down, showed me how to read it. They were one and a half inches long. And we recorded it, the length. Then we did another one. And then another one. And he says, okay, now you go to your room and do a thousand of these. And I want you to keep the shortest and the longest nail. I'm like, okay. So I went in my room and I played with my army man. <laughs> <laughs> and I looked out the window and I measured the nail and I played with my army man some more. And I think this is, this is, oh my God, I measure a thousand freaking nails. <laughs> you know how many nails that is? <laughs> So I started writing down numbers, trying to stay in the neighborhood of about an inch and a half. <laughs> and when I was done, that took two hours, just to fake it, right? I bring it out and give him the sheet, and he's looking at it, and he's looking at it, and he starts drawing, he's making some graphs, and he's looking at some of my points. He looks at me. He looks at the page, and I, I, I think I've gotten away with it. And he keeps looking at me, and he says, you didn't measure a damn thing. I go, oh, yeah, I did. He goes, no, you didn't. I go, I did. He goes, you didn't. And he says, you, you got to do it again. I'm like, what? So I went back to my room with the clipboard and the paper, picked up all the nails. I went in there, and you guess what I did? I closed the blinds, and I put a towel under the door. I thought you peeped underneath me, and I wish you could see me, and I was there. And it took another hour and a half to figure out measures in the neighborhood of an inch and a half. And I brought it back out, and he goes, damn you. You did it again. I got looked at it twice because you didn't measure anything. And I'm like, I did. I swear I did. <laughs> and so we sat there. It took like eight hours. And we measured these nails. And we kept the biggest and we kept the shortest. And they were visibly different. And we graphed their, their height. 
Um, and it was the most beautiful bell curve Gaussian distribution you've ever seen. Absolutely beautiful. And I was like, wow. I mean, the power of that. It was also my first exposure to scientific misconduct. <laughs> Guilty. <laughs> I fabricated and falsified that. And, and, I, and that came back again later in life, not that particular instance, but the fabrication, falsification of data, because I had that along with perjury um, demonstrated by the National State Condition Association to stop CrossFit. Now, the fitness thing, you know, I, uh, I didn't like school. Didn't like measuring the nails, and didn't like the math. I was, really wasn't interested in any of that. But I like PE, I like recess a lot. And so I said, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go work at the gym, that's what I'm gonna do. <coughs> and without even knowing it, I brought some baggage with me. And part of it was that in, in stepping into the industry, both feet, I said, let's do this. Let's define some terms and measure some shit. What do you think of like that? Like, why don't we define fitness? And while we're at it, let's give it a definition that's amenable to accurate, precise estimation. Never been done before. I found the ACSM and the NSCA's definition of fitness. Um, they had a combined statement on fitness, and Lon Kilgore, some of you remember him from our, from our community, from the fitness world. But uh, the, the ACSM definition of fitness had 35 terms, and there were things like vitality, well being. There was only, only two that could conceivably be measured it was power and energy, and I'm sure they didn't mean in the sense that you would be using the term scientifically. And you can tell what had happened is a committee passed the paper around and everybody got to add something and they made that this big, long, ugly run on sentence as the definition of fitness. And so what I did was I offered up that, that fitness was work capacity measured across broad time and mold lanes. And it's doing a whole bunch of different things at a whole bunch of different durations. You can map that out, you can graph that. And I said that the theory was that constantly varying high intensity functional movement would increase work capacity across broad time and moral domains. And I put that up to the world. I defined the, the uh, constantly varying high intensity functional movement as CrossFit. And I called the work capacity measured across broad time and moral domains fitness. And so we had CrossFit makes fitness. And that is what created 15,000 gyms around the world in a, what, a decade. <coughs> that, that alone. Now, the academic response to this. Um, I have never seen an academic criticism, or any criticism, a serious criticism, of the notion that work capacity across broad time and modal domains is the result of possibly very high intensity functional movement. <coughs> and what happened when the National Strength and Conditioning Association, you may not know who that is, but the NSCA, the National Strength and Conditioning Association, the American College of Sports Medicine, build themselves as the twin academic pillars of, uh, of scientific pillars of academic exercise science. And what the National Strength and Conditioning Association did in response to constantly very high intensity functional movement was they conducted a study. And the study showed that CrossFit did wonderful things, but that 16% of the participants were hurt. And it didn't take, not, I knew just looking at the data that they faked it. And the deal was this, there's no way, it was done in an affiliate, there's no way you can introduce CrossFit to a group of people and not have about 25% of them not come back. Not because they're hurt, but because no one told them that they were actually gonna have to exercise. See, the holy grail in our industry was that 10 minutes a day without perspiration, discomfort, or elevated heart rate, you're going to get fit, right? And that couldn't be further from the truth. And so there's always people who just walk away, and they had no walkaways. And they had a 16% injury rate. So we called the gal that ran the gym, the guy that ran the gym, and she introduced us to the girl that conducted the, conducted the uh, uh, study. And she's like, I don't want to lose my job at the ACSM. She was an ACSM employee. But there were no injuries. It's a lie. <clears throat> so uh, we called uh, William Kramer, who was uh, uh, the CEO, the head uh, of the National Strength and Association, 
and talk to him about there's problems with this study, and he said he wasn't going to do anything about it. So we filed suit. And in that suit, we eventually got our hands on emails where we actually got to see, and that took a forensic uh, examination by a legal team as court ordered by a federal judge. And they said they had no, no emails responsive to our requests. We got a trove of them. And it was fascinating to actually see in real time this conspiracy to commit this fabrication, false fiction of data play out. So the studies turned in, the editor in chief says, there's no injuries, I won't publish this without injuries. And he says, there were no injuries. And he says, and I'm not gonna publish it. And two weeks later, he says, email, hey, I got the injuries. And he's good, I knew you could. And it's published. And it published. So I got peer reviewed. Now the old man, it was the nails, right? My whole life, I heard him ranting on Karl Popper, the three Ps, P values, and peer review. Hated him. And it said, "Well, I just got peer review," and and it was it was quite a blow. It, it was they said it was the most cited study in all of exercise science ever. Now that we did that by showing everyone this abomination, and we played a big part of that in court. That tried to get hung on us is, is you caused this, but that didn't work. But uh, the whole process of, of how this played out was so fascinating to me. And I spent the past two years um, reading David Stove, reading E.T. James, and we'll talk more about that later briefly. It's kind of a talk for another day. But uh, one of the things in looking at broken science that's, that's made the, the the discussion awkward, I think, is that so many people that are weighing in on the broken science, on the replication crisis, um, came up through that system of peer review and frequentist uh, statistics and the whole process. Um, they don't, they don't know the unbrokenness of it. And so the terminology I'm going to use is modern science and postmodern science. And I think that the discussion of modern science. Um, describing what science looks like unbroken makes it much easier to understand the nature of the break and a lot of other things about science. So what I'm going to do is walk you through here, this is the meat of the, of the up here, I'm going to walk you through what science is and then we're going to take a, we're going to modern science and we're going to take a look at the nature of what is an epistemic debasement that put it in the state that it is today. And, uh, so let's, let's start that. I'm going to start with four words, four common words. Um, we use them all the time, and in, in science, they have, they have a, 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 a precise meaning. And I'll just take you through this. Observation, measurement, prediction, and validation. And observation is a registration of the real world on our senses or sensing equipment. Easy enough, right? Measurement. When that observation is tied to a standard scale with a well-characterized error, um, it becomes a fact or a measurement. If we map that one well, fact to a future unrealized fact, a prediction, we get a prediction. It's a fact mapped to a future unrealized fact. It's a forecast of a measurement, and it also constitutes a model. Validation, derived from the predictive strength of the model, graded and raked as conjecture, hypothesis, theory, and law. So, observation, registration of the real world, we tie it to a standard scale with a word characterized error, becomes a measurement or a fact, map that fact to another unrealized fact, and the predictive strength of it, which sounds like the probability, doesn't it? That's where the validation comes from. Let's look at conjecture, hypothesis, theory, and law. And by the way, the old man with the nails, um, he was head of internal research and development at Hughes Aircraft Company, and this is, the, this is the way that they taught young PhDs from Caltech and from Harvard and from MIT and UCLA. They indoctrinated them as to what science was, because their finding was from recruiting the universities that there was a serious problem in engineering with what science was. So let's talk about a conjecture. Conjecture is an incomplete model or analogy to another domain. I'll give you an example of that. It's uh, entropy, right? In fact, that's made several jumps into information theory to, and to probability. But an incomplete model or analogy of that domain. Hypothesis 
is a model based on all data in its specified domain, with no counterexamples, incorporating a novel prediction yet to be validated by facts. Easy enough. And a theory is a hypothesis <laughs> with at least one non-trivial data. Did an experiment, and it panned out. You got the prediction. A law is a theory that has received validation in all passable ramifications to known levels of accuracy. Easy enough. Now, five criteria of modern science, and and uh, we can we can you can see these from what we looked at before. But the first is that modern science is the source and repository of objective knowledge. Number two, this knowledge silos and models graded and ranked by their predictive strength, conjecture, hypothesis, theory, and law. Right. Third one, models are a forecast of a measurement. And four, predictive strength is the sole determinant of validation. In fact, validation and method are entirely independent. And the line was that the theory, whether it comes from inspiration or perspiration, has validity on its predictive strength, and nothing in method invalidates it. Could have come from a dream, could have found it in a notebook in an alley, or it could have been through hard, hard work over many years. Let's talk about the philosophy of modern science, and then I'm going to share the epistemic debasement. We're going to move towards the break here. Modern science is inductive, and as the conclusions come from premises with probability and not certainty, it's the probability of the hypothesis given the data is bracketed between zero and one, not including, right? Versus true or false. The demarcation of science from non science is the predictive power of the models of science. And someone very famously got that horribly wrong. In fact, when Popper said it was falsification, it was Thomas Kuhn that says, I don't think that's right. That doesn't settle what you set off to answer, which was that you needed a demarcation that could differentiate astronomy from astrology. And falsification doesn't. Third, the inexorable march of scientific progress is the improved predictive strength of its models. Four, predictive strength is the sole source of rational trust of modern science. The sole source, the predictive strength. I've come to realize that all trust comes from predictive strength. You trust your insurance company on its predictive strength. Your insurance company trusts you on, on, on your predictive strength. We trust our spouse, or your spouse trusts you, you trust your kids on the predictive strength. It's a very simple concept. Let me show you what happened to this. In academic science, and we can show you who did this next, the probability of a hypothesis is meaningless. A, 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 a hypothesis is a proposition, and it only has values true or false. Copper chose falsification as a demarcation between science and nonsense. Falsification is necessary but not sufficient. It's odd because he got this, I believe, from A.J. Ayers. And Ayers was the part of the Vienna Circle, and Ayers had offered up falsification as a requirement for a meaningful assertion. That for something to have meaning, it had to be conceivably falsified. The third one, the inexorable march of scientific progress, is the improved predictive strength of models. What it becomes from what we're calling the irrationalists is the denied progress and the improved reliability of revised theories of models. Thomas Kuhn said that the, the new theory with the new paradigm shift isn't a better one, it's just a new one. But he does mention that scientists will test the proposition, and when it doesn't meet their predictions, they might want to throw it out. He got so close that he couldn't do it. Um, predictive strength is the sole source of rational trust of modern science, becomes in postmodern science, predictive strength has been replaced with null hypothesis, significant testing, peer review, producing an enormous body of science that will replicate. I want to I wanna give some credit and blame for where this happened, how this shift came. And uh, I'll just share this. On, on the subject of prediction, uh, I spent a lot of time looking at, at, at prediction and our interest in it. And I, I kind of put this list together. And I, was, I would have shared this sooner, but I've, I haven't had the energy to memorize these freaking things. <laughs> but uh, grab any one of them and look it up. I won't give you the slides. But it's crazy. I think from you know, scaring birds and watching which way they fly, and that would, that would suggest something about the planets. I mean, just crazy stuff. And I, put, I added some things to the list here. I put, uh, I think I've got uh, consensus science in here, right? Yeah, haha. -ha. 
And then I put uh, modern science in here. And I suggest that that's the only one of these that's ever panned out and never been able to predict anything. Um, this, this is how strong our desire for prediction is. That people have been searching for methods for reliable prediction forever and in all cultures. There are four philosophers of science, Popper, Kuhn, Lakatos, and Feyerabend, and their grip on academia is, is, uh, is complete. Now, you can, you can look at Popper, Kuhn, Lakatos, and Feyerabend and, and come up with uh, some rather profound distinctions from them, but it really misses the point. And I use the example, it'd be like talking about Charles Manson and how different he is from John Wayne Gacy, <laughs> how different he is than Jeffrey Dahmer, and never covering the fact that they're all three serial killing murderers. And what these guys have in common on top of their differences is that they all took Hume's inductive skepticism to heart and believed that reliable knowledge couldn't come from induction. And so they put this thing on a deductive footing and then it's remained that can maintain in academia. Hume, by the way, gets kind of an odd pass, it seems, even from our friend David Stove. And Hume said that, that, that you couldn't get certain knowledge from induction. And well, that's exactly the point. It, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't, it doesn't return ones and zeros. You get zero to one down. So uh, David Stove wrote brilliantly his whole career, it's fundamentally all he did, it seemed, um, was write on, on these four uh, people that he called irrationalists, and I think it's a perfect fit. Uh, my dad thought it should be post-hyphen-modern. He didn't think it quite meant the tenets of postmodernism, but I think that anything goes kind of culture is, is consistent there. But I can't recommend enough reading David Stove, because I think he gives all the reason you need not to spend too much time with Karl Popper, Thomas Kuhn, Mikados, or Fire. And there are things I can say nice about these guys, but I am going to give them credit for the, for the schism, for the break. Let's look again. Now, these guys, these are my frequentists that are responsible for, that's not fair to say, um, it is claimed that null hypothesis significance testing has its origins in those works, but it's not really how it, what had happened. What happened was that uh, academic publishers of statistics books and psychology texts took the brilliant work of Ronald Fisher, of Aragon Pearson, and Jerson Naiman and combined it into null hypothesis significance testing in a manner that we know they all three would have been very much unhappy about. It violated the, the tenets of no hypothesis significance testing, violated some hard stated rules of each of those mathematicians. So a misunderstanding, and it's Gerd Gigerenzer from the Max Planck Institute that has a series of papers, he's kind of like David Stove, for 20 years he's been saying the same thing over and over and over and over again. With this uh, no hypothesis testing, the significance testing has led us astray, creates over certainty. Now, these are the guys that developed a philosophy of science um, that doesn't have no hypothesis significance testing. It doesn't mention anything about peer review. And we start with Laplace. We've got Jeffries here, Richard Cox, Claude Shannon, George Pauly, and E.T. James. What's interesting about these philosophers of science is that they were first and foremost world-class scientists with strong feelings, strong views on the philosophy of science. It's really not what we have in, on the other side. Yeah, I, got to, I put some, together some, some questions. Um, I'm going to say frequently asked because we haven't been doing this enough. But there are questions that should be asked, and I thought we could just rip through here. It'd be kind of fun to do. It's a little bit tongue-in-cheek. But what do you mean by broken? Well, we've been talking about broken science for a long time, and I haven't been asked what I mean by broken. And, and, but I, you need to be asked, what I mean by broken is won't replicate. So that's easy enough. Let's go to the next one. Becoming what? So broken, what's it become? Perverted, unreliable, corrupt, deviant, postmodern, postmodern, irreplicable, trustworthy, <laughs> shitty. <laughs> it's, it's not working. And by the way, I am not as most research findings are false. I can improve that work, just make it most research findings are improbable, right? Even there, the truth and falseness of it, looking for that zero or one, and what happens? 
man, you, you, you work up to the magic number, and it's true, right? Number three, what part of science was broken? The validation prior, criteria, predictive strength of the hypothesis replaced with publication in special magazines, and null hypothesis equivalence tested. And that's what was changed. Where is broken science found? At universities worldwide, the natural sciences are negligently affected, whereas the social sciences and medicine are hobbled by broken science. Number five. Do you just cut that corner? When did the break occur? Is Green David Zandian in 1934? with Popper's uh, uh, publishing of the logic of scientific discovery. And there, Popper denies induction and offers falsification. We're off to the basis. Number six, where? And the answer is, from Vienna to the rest of academia, broken science is found in peer-reviewed literature or research proposal in universities. He walked out of frame. I say, Harvard did not get into um, industrial science is largely uh, unfazed by this. The, the, greatest, the greatest phase is interacting with the university and recruiting people. There are fields like pharma, though, that have been, that have been tainted. They found it, it's easier now to, to get a good p-value, right? To, and to get a, a university professors to give a thumbs up or Photoshop your results. You know, in the Photoshopped uh, uh, Western blots, uh, the great line was, uh, there's no disease Photoshop can't cure. <laughs> I love that. How? Hume's inductive skepticism seemed to dictate a deductive framework for the scientific method. It was the desire for certainty that pushed Popper in that direction. It, and it, it's, taken a, it's taken a considerable amount of brilliance to, to make sense of uncertainty. And, uh, and Matt Briggs here has, I think, done a better job of that than anybody. I would add you to the list of those, of those great people, Matt, but you're still alive, so <laughs> you have to wait. <laughs> and who? Who broke it? Popper, Kuhn, Lucados, and Fire Robin took the philosophy of science, and textbook publishers who fused the work of Fisher, Naiman, and Pearson to form uh, null hypothesis significance testing. By the way, no hypothesis significant testing isn't a part of statistics. Number nine, producing a vast body of science that won't replicate. Number ten, how much of academic science won't replicate? Well, that's not really known. Most of it is a safe bet. Uh, Iannotti said most research findings are false, and that came from an Amgen attempted replication of 53 studies deemed landmark in preclinical oncology and hematology. After a decade and spending a billion dollars, six of the 53 studies can be replicated. And again, the natural science is negligibly affected and impacted. I want to share this because it's very important. We don't know of the 53 studies. We don't know which they were. We don't know which six were good. Um, they weren't retracted. They still stand today. Entire fields of medicine have been developed from these, from these 53 studies. One of the papers has been, has been uh, uh, cited 5,000 times since being found to not replicate. Now, your oncologist may be scientific in the way she administers your treatment, but the, and the treatment may be effective, but it doesn't have, it, it, and, and, it, and maybe more likely it's not effective. But what it wasn't done, it wasn't developed scientifically. The field's poison, tainted. Um, clinical trials were conducted off of these studies, and a lot of them. So that means people were exposed to things based on a fraud. Number 11, what will it take to fix it? That's not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> I, can, I, can't, I can't imagine it. I said that's not going to happen, but change would seem impossible absent recognition of the problem. And we had at CrossFit Health, we'd say, let's start with the truth. And the Latin for that is in Sipiamus Veritate. And what I can tell you is that I don't think it's going to get better, but it, it doesn't seem even remotely possible that it will get better if we're not honest about what's wrong. Yeah. And so that would be the first step in any case. Number 12, is there an alternative to null hypothesis testing? Let me give you just one. 
And I said, answer, of course, the practice is unknown in industry, if not found in the field of statistics. Um, Briggs, Nguyen, and Traffamau is the replacement for hypothesis testing 2019. The spring of structural changes and their economic modeling, econometric modeling, offers an elegant and powerful proposition of, and this is a quote from the, from the, the, the work, returning to an old idea of making direct predictions by models of observables, assessing the value of evidence by the change in predictability, and then verifying the predictions of reality. I said, imagine that. That is like, I can tell you that works. That works. Why? Because it's, it's what science is. 13, what's wrong with p-values? There's nothing inherently wrong with the concept. The problem is the pervasive misinterpretation leading to an epidemic of over certainty in academic science. Um, fellow named Oaks asked a whole bunch of students in statistics <coughs> and, and uh, psychology, um, uh, research assistants, professors, uh, went through the whole, whole gamut of academics and, and, and students that should be skilled, should know something about p-values. In the study, they asked people to identify which of these was true or false. The first one, we've absolutely disproved the null hypothesis is with a weak p, a p of 0.01, false. You found the probability of the null hypothesis being true. False. You have absolutely proved your experimental hypothesis. False. You can declare the probability of the experimental hypothesis being true. No, you can't. You know if you decide to reject the null hypothesis, the probability that you're making the right, the right decision. No, you do not. Um, you have a reliable experimental finding in the sense that if hypothetically the experiment were repeated a great, great number of times, you'd obtain a significant <laughs> result on any of occasions, that too is false. Now, what percentage of those that were asked which of these are true were able to say they're all false? It was 3%. 3% could actually say, yeah, none of those are true. And it's really easy to do. Anything that claims to be shedding light on the hypothesis is going to be false. And anything that's off uncertainty is going to be false. The p-value only speaks to the probability of the data given the hypothesis, it has nothing to say on the probability of any hypothesis. In 1966, a fellow named Backett and then later Thompson in 96 and 99 added to this list, and this is, this is just a fun list to run through, a p-value is the probability that the results will replicate if the study is conducted again. False. We should have more confidence in p-values obtained with larger ends than smaller, so it's actually backwards. With a big enough sample space, with a big enough n, p-values are always going to be low. Uh, a p-value is a measure of the degree of confidence in the obtained result. False. A p-value automates the process of making inductive inference. False. You still have to do that yourself and most don't bother. Five, significant testing lends objectivity to the inferential process. It really doesn't. A p-value is an inference from population parameters to our research hypothesis. It is not. Uh, a p-value is a measure of confidence we should have in the veracity of our research hypothesis. And again, it's false. A p-value tells you something about the members of your sample. No, it doesn't. A p-value is a measure of the validity of the inductions made based on the, on the results. That is false. A p-value is the probability that the null is true or false given the data. It's not. A p-value is the probability that the alternative hypothesis is true or false. So this is false. And a p-value is the probability that the results obtained occurred due to chance. And he says this is very popular, but nevertheless false. The complaints about p-values and null hypothesis significant testing have been, it's a, it's a 60, 70 year story now. And the constancy, it's not, it's not changing, it's not evolving. They were wrong 60 or 70 years ago. They're still wrong today, and there's been really no change. To whose advantage? The broken science. Academia, with the explosion of new sciences, scientists, published research and research and researchers. I think tenure, labs, grants, staff, and fame are the rewards for shitty science. That's it. <laughs> so what broke? Validation was flensed in academic sense from science from the scientific method. The impossibility or, or the, the, the view that 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 um, that a, a, a hypothesis um, 
the, the, the probability of a hypothesis not having meaning cripples the process. It's over at that point. And you're left with that true or false nonsense. And what role does corruption play? I like this one. There's two definitions of corruption. One is kind of dishonesty for personal gain. Almost all teachers have this. The second one is something made unreliable by alteration, like a corrupted file. And what my contention is that the epistemic debasement of modern science created unreliable science that attracted industry and others to practice every manner of scientific misconduct for personal gain. Peer review and weak key values are readily jiggered for cash. And I gotta tell you, if you it would be much easier to convince a dean of a, uh, a, a new theory of uh, the origins of sex or gender than it would be to sell a rocket fuel to Elon that doesn't work. I can promise you that. And 16. What is the funniest thing you ever said at PR? This is it. I absolutely love it. An hypothesis that may be true is rejected because it failed to predict observable results that have not occurred. This seems a remarkable procedure. And that was, and that was Sir Harold uh, uh, it's Jeffries, actually, in the 1939 Matt Jennings. Someone, someone goofed that up. So that's it. That's what people do. Did you get anything from that? <laughs> <laughs>